The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone, to Imaging Applications in Quantum Research, a webinar presented by Princeton Instruments and hosted by Photonics Media. My name is Robin Riley, and I'm the Photonics Media Web Editor. Our speaker today is Michael Melly. He is the Product Manager of Imaging for Princeton Im Instruments. Michael will be speaking today on emerging applications for quantum technology that will incorporate imaging. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, please log out and log back in to rejoin. A recording of the webinar will be available on the Photonics Media website shortly after the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions throughout Michael's presentation. Just type your question in the question box to the right of your screen, and we will answer as many as possible at the end of the session. And now I'd like to turn the presentation over to our speaker, Michael Melly of Princeton Instruments. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Robin. All right, thanks everybody for joining the webinar. I wanna thank Photonic Media for assisting us in putting the project together. Very excited to be sharing the next hour with you guys, uh, talking about imaging applications in quantum research. Uh, Princeton Instruments has been involved in quantum for well over a decade, but we really, um, this is the first time we've put together all our thoughts and experiences uh, with ourselves and uh, the folks we work with and uh, research researchers to put together a presentation. So I'm sure there's something in here that will be of benefit to those in attendance. So I'll give you a quick overview of what we'll do from a um, agenda standpoint. So we'll start out with just kind of a brief history of quantum theory and mechanics and We'll keep it brief, even though there's a lot of subject matter there, but more to so we we'll have some common terminology going forward in the presentation. And then we'll talk about some uh, quantum research areas that are uh, you know mainstream and also uh, some newer technologies being developed. Then we'll go into some of the imaging parts of uh, quantum research, you know, how imaging applications are are used, what technologies incorporated, and some of the choices you have in imaging technology, and then at the end we'll bring it all together and we'll marry some of the imaging technology to the research areas and show how different imaging uh, technologies uh, used and uh, how its uh, researchers are benefit benefiting from it. So that's kind of what we're going to be covering today. So kind of appropriate for quantum uh, research, we'll start at the lowest level, the, the tiniest bit, and that would be, you know, what does quantum mean? A Latin word, uh, you know, meaning how much. Quantum theory, a very broad term, and, and you'll see throughout the presentation, a lot of this is interpretation of what um, terminology means, and uh, there's a lot of variation in, in some of these definitions, but uh, a simple explanation of quantum theory is uh, nature and behavior at the atomic and subatomic level, and that's really kind of what caused the, the quantum uh, theory to develop was the fact that prior uh, theorems didn't describe behavior at that level. And the theories attempt to describe matter uh, and energy by its state. And then ultimately, uh, the goal for a quantum is to be able to manipulate the state to achieve uh, a certain result. That's a little bit ironic because the whole nature of quantum is uh, non-deterministic and more probabilistic. A uh, little uh, irony there. So we'll go step back in time before quantum theory. You know, for the most part, the world was uh, uh, described in more mechanical ways uh, with, with Newtonian physics, and then in a macroscopic fashion, we'll call it, and that sometimes is called the first unification of physics, where uh, for the most part, the, the world understood and agreed to uh, a way to describe itself. And then further on, uh, Maxwell, joined in and offered some theories on magnetism and electricity and so forth. And that was also well adopted and, and has been labeled the second unification of physics. Uh, I like, I'm going to quote um, 
uh, a Nobel laureate, Frank Vilcek, who's now with MIT, he wrote a lecture and uh, it, it, it's almost poetic in nature. So he describes uh, in a lecture called Quantum Beauty. He says, uh, quantum is realizing the dreams of Pythagoras and Plato and building on the insights of Newton and Maxwell. So where did quantum come from? Why is it so much in the news now? And what's it all about, right? So it really came about because uh, researchers and scientists were having trouble using prior definitions of uh, energy and matter uh, to describe the phenomenon they were seeing. And for, for the most part, uh, uh, in particular, uh, Planck's work in black body radiation, um, Einstein's photoelectric effects, and some of the work by Niels Bohr. Quantum, uh, we'll say, went through an explosion period uh, in the early 20th century, and there were a lot of theorems, a lot of discussions, a lot of disagreement in what, what was happening. And I'm not going to go into a lot of that background here in this presentation, but um, concepts like uh, wave particle duality and um, going back even to the early 1800s with Young's double split, slit experiment, uh, Heisenberg uncertainty, uh, Copenhagen interpretation, Schrodinger's cat, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen paradox, all concepts that were um, well thought and heavily debated uh, in the early 20th century. And there's a lot of history there, which led to a lot of what the uh, research and technology and development today. So moving forward, uh, modern quantum activity, very broad. Um, and certainly quantum and people involved in quantum understand that it will impact our lives in many ways going forward. And probably why so many on the are on the call today to uh, to learn and and discuss first wave of quantum technology as it's commonly referred to but not universally referred to as uh, quantum mechanics and principles of wave particle duality and uh, often described as the second wave is uh, the concepts of superposition entanglement and with the goal of creating practical technology uh, entanglement's been around for quite a long time, and going back almost a century. Um, in the past four decades, uh, the concept of entanglement was uh, further developed by uh, John Bell. And uh, today, entanglement forms the basis of uh, many new applications, like uh, in quantum com communications, metrology, and computing. Uh, so the second quantum revolution is generally understood to be realization of these new capabilities. Okay, so let's let's go back to the to the micro nano level, and um, this presentation kind of moves in and out of uh, quantum theory, quantum research, and at times talks about quantum computing just because it's such a big part of quantum. When we talk about the the call the least common denominator in quantum, you know, the qubit, it's help it's helpful to talk in terms of the um, uh, quantum computing aspect. So the, the qubit is the, the, call it the fundamental uh, element, no pun intended, of the, uh, of the quantum computing. It's analogous to the classical bit in that it's uh, um, the information center. Uh, it differs in quite a number of stark ways and primarily because it can represent uh, more than two states. Uh, it can re represent more than two states uh, simultaneously, which is referred to as superposition. And, and then uh, a little earlier, we talked about quantum entanglement, which uh, is a concept that um, for some, including myself, uh, is, a, is an evolutionary uh, concept that uh, always could use further understanding. But it's uh, basically uh, when two particles so distant from one another that no signal could connect them, nevertheless, they possess invisible and instantaneous connection. So there's a there's a mouthful uh, for the for the mouth and the brain to to comprehend. So quantum uh, has a system element to it as well, and this is a, a just a brief summary. Three points that were um, part of a uh, AMO committee meeting on science, atoms, and molecules uh, back in 2010. I like this definition of quantum system because it kind of talks about, you know, 
when you have a qubit, what's next? So it talks about uh, initialization into a, a, a well-defined state, uh, performing sufficient operations, uh, and then measurement of the state with, in this definition, high quantum efficiency. I have a note in there. You can also see the DiVincenzo criteria. DiVincenzo is a, is a physicist, many publications, well-respected. He further expanded what uh, quantum system requirements are. He developed five criteria for uh, quantum computing and then two additional criteria for quantum communication. Uh, so it's worth taking a look at his work as well. All right, so let's talk about research and what people are doing and why it's interesting. So quantum materials, I don't really like the term material, but let's use quantum materials as a broad term to describe uh, condensed matter physics, you know, to, to associate uh, objects that present strong electrical correlations. So uh, electrical, electronic properties that uh, are linked to quantum effects, um, and these can be uh, in the form of ultra-cold atoms, ions, diamond defects, quantum dots, et cetera. So, uh, from this point on in the presentation, we're going to talk in a little more specific specificity on the um, these uh, research areas, why they're important to to quantum research, and then ultimately fold in uh, how the imaging aspect is is being implemented. So on the uh, rest of the talk, we'll talk about these specific kinds of applications uh, using photons. Uh, semiconductor and superconducting, uh, cold atoms, trapped ions, and, and an additional couple more like uh, quantum dots and uh, such. So these are the leading physical platforms from, for quantum information processing, you know, things like photons, spins and semiconductors, and ultra-cold atoms, and so forth. So trapped ions, it, you'll hear this term a lot. It's uh, a lot of research being developed to uh, physically control ions as well as uh, molecules and, and atoms and so forth and why it's important. So the ion trap enables the manipulation and interrogation of atomic or molecular ions. So in other words, we talked a little bit earlier about um, initiating a state and controlling a state. So this is what the ion trap is all about. Um, with respect to imaging, Typically, the ion trap needs amplification and imaging techniques uh, uh, are helped uh, with imaging the light emitted by the ions uh, and also uh, to uh, spatially and temporally coordinate them in an uh, electromagnetic field. So things like uh, size and shape of ion sample, number of stored particles, temperature, quantum state, and so forth are uh, the types of information that are pulled from uh, trapped ion experiments. Uh, cold atoms, um, a subset of the cold atom uh, technology is BEC or Bose-Einstein condensates. Uh, that technology and that uh, discovery is now decades old, but still um, very applicable to uh, quantum uh, research. Uh, so there's various techniques in cold atom uh, development, fluorescence, absorption, and phase contrast imaging, uh, the latter being... Um, uh, referred to in other terms as well. So uh, what's particular about this, and especially with uh, BEC or Bose-Einstein condensates, we cool the atoms down to very low temperature, you know, nearly as close to absolute zero as, as possible. And at that temperature, uh, the atoms are in a really highly coherent uh, quantum state. So they occupy uh, essentially the same position in space. And now we can... Uh, introduce the uh, concept of quantum entanglement uh, that exists between the atoms. Superconducting qubits, uh, definitely a lot of research here with respect to uh, qubits in terms of developing a quantum computer. Uh, again, superconductivity in very low temperatures, uh, zero electrical resistance and exclusion of interior magnetic field. Uh, often return to, uh, referred to as the Meisner effect. Uh, one of the driving forces here in superconducting qubits and in 
the incorporation of semiconductor material is always with the uh, look towards uh, manufacturability. So, um, you know, leading um, semiconductor and computer companies are investing heavily here, but they always have an eye on, hey, is what we're doing commercially viable? In other words, are the are the uh, qubits capable of uh, production in large quantities? And, uh, and they, can they be inter integrated for interaction in very prescribed ways? And you'll see in this uh, technology field, you'll hear about charged qubits, qubits, flux qubits, phase qubits, transmons, et cetera. So that's some of the terminology you'll hear. But again, a very exciting field in, the, in quantum research for super superconducting. Single photon and emission and detection. So this, uh, especially for those of us in imaging, when we hear this, we think about uh, cameras and uh, detectors and so forth. Uh, in the context of this presentation and how we're describing the single photon emission and detection, we're really talking about um, photon generation and detection within a quantum system. So it's not an analysis tool, it's not a measurement tool or an imaging tool, it's actually part of the quantum system. You know, um, when you talk about fiber optic communication, uh, quantum information, encryption, medical imaging, uh, astrophysics, materials, and so forth, these technologies as they mature are, are contemplating um, photon uh, emission and detection as the, the, call it the information transfer mechanism. So we're not talking about, in this case, things like uh, you know, photon detectors, CCDs, or EMCCDs, or APDs. We're talking about photon emission within a um, quantum system, and in a very, another very exciting area, uh, and a lot of research being de dedicated to uh, emission and collection of photons. Diamond vacancies, often referred to as nit nitrogen vacancy or vacancy centers, uh, is literally a, a defect form in a diamond uh, through uh, substitution uh, at the atomic level. Uh, what's nice about diamond vacancies is um, coherently controlled. So NV centers are good at holding on to quantum information, uh, i.e. electron spin states, good coherence times uh, on the order of a second. Uh, research is showing that might be extended. Um, diamond vacancies have great application in quantum computing, but also many others uh, such as medical imaging and, and uh, nanoscale sensing as well. Quantum dots, um, I'd be surprised if no one on the call today has heard of quantum dots. It's, uh, again, in the news quite a bit. It's What's interesting about quantum dots is it's, uh, out of all the technologies we've described so far, it might be the broadest applied outside of uh, quantum technology, even though, you know, the quantum dot itself is 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 quantum. Um, so nanocrystal, nanocrystals of semiconductor material uh, in the nanometer size range, uh, used in medicine, photovoltaics, displays, biosensing, uh, also could be very useful in quantum information processing. Uh, so the quantum dot dates back to uh, Alexei Ikhomov, a Russian solid state physicist, uh, work um, uh, a few decades ago, a couple of decades ago, uh, when he was working on quantum dots for electron spin orientation in semiconductors. Typically, the materials have been uh, things like cadmium selenide, cadmium sulfide, indium arsenide, but more and more research is being done now on um, organic and inorganic materials such as perovskites uh, with particular attention to photovo photovoltaics. So that's uh, kind of a summary on a lot of the research being done in quantum theory and quantum uh, physics. Certainly not a comp comprehensive list, but I've kind of stacked the deck a little bit because those applications we've discussed thus far are uh, very well um, suited towards the kind of imaging applications and technology we'll talk about in the second half of the uh, discussion here. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, detectors. And again, this is not referring to um, photon emitters and detectors that are used within a quantum system uh, as part of the quantum information science. These are detectors for the most part used in evaluating research uh, experiments uh, in order to gain more insight into uh, results and uh, further uh, further research. So photon detectors and 
a very broad sense, you know, we're converting photons into an electrical signal. Uh, a lot of different types out there, uh, photodiodes, photoconductors, uh, uh, avalanche photodiodes. For the most part today, we're going to be talking about area detectors, in other words, 2D detectors, uh, not, not uh, you know, single transistors, uh, not linear arrays, but mostly 2D arrays. Uh, not to say that some of these other detectors aren't applicable. There's certainly very, uh, a lot of research being done with uh, uh, avalanche photodiodes, uh, PMTs. Uh, there's even a lot of research being done now on things like superconducting nanowire single photon detectors, which is a mouthful, um, near infrared and optical single photon detectors. So there's a lot of research being done out there, just we're not gonna cover it in today's, uh, today's talk. All right, so let's talk about photon detectors and why they're important and what researchers need uh, from a feature and performance standpoint. So you'll see, in our opinion, you know, four of the main requirements of photon detectors, um, noise, frame rate, quantum efficiency, which is QE and quantitative. In other words, uh, not a binary result, a, a quantitative result that's repeatable, linear, and these kinds of things. So high quantum efficiency, we need to uh, convert as much of the light source or energy source into a capturable signal. Low noise, so uh, very important, especially when you get into low light levels, uh, low flux, uh, you, you need a large differentiation between good signal and bad. So the electronics of a camera and the electronics of a, a system have to uh, you have to eliminate or reduce as much of the background noise or the unwanted noise as possible. Certain applications require high, high frame rate, and that can be interpreted a couple of different ways. It could be literally a, a fast running camera where hundreds or even thousands of frames per second based on the type of experiment being done. Uh, but it could also mean frame rate as far as acquisition time or uh, image acquisition and uh, initialization, you know, how quickly can you, in a time deterministic way, grab a frame and uh, be certain that the frames acquired and uh, in a temporal fashion. And it's got to be quantitative. So uh, linearity over wide dynamic range, you know, you know, if you're looking at faint signals and uh, there's a, then all of a sudden a, a, a large fluorescent signal, you have to, the camera has to be able to accommodate uh, both types of uh, scenes. And you can add to that uh, a lot of other camera characteristics of which we list a few here as far as uh, dynamic range, full well, and then certainly last but not least is equipment like this has to be easy to use and it's got to be uh, software controlled and so forth. So we're going to narrow the discussion down even a little bit further from what we've talked about so far. And we're going to talk about, for the most part, uh, visible and shortwave infrared imaging. The definition, the best understood definition of visible imaging would be uh, silicon-based detectors. They have some uh, relative sensitivity in the UV range, you know, down below 200 nanometers, and certainly up to, um, you know, we've recently uh, worked on some silicon detectors that have relatively high QE, Q of above 25%. Uh, almost up to 1,100 nanometers, which is a fairly high QE for that type of uh, visible range. And then we'll talk about shortwave infrared, and you'll see that that covers, uh, for the most part, 850-900 nanometers on the low end, up to about 2.2 2 microns on the high end. And the typical materials for those are listed there. Um, we're going to talk specifically about uh, in-gas and gallium arsenide detectors today. So that's kind of we're narrowing further the discussion today regarding the uh, imaging applications. So when we talk about 2D arrays in silicon, for the most part, we're going to be talking about these technologies today, CCD charge coupled device. Uh, EMCCD is electron multiplication, so it's a feature added to a, a CCD. Uh, ICCD stands for intensified CCD, where we're using an external device to um, 
increase the signal uh, prior to the detector. And then uh, a fairly new technology, which is EM ICCD. So we're taking a, uh, an EM uh, electron multiplica multiplication chip and adding uh, intensification to it. And we'll talk about what the benefits of that are. And then we'll talk about CMOS and in particular scientific CMOS, a silicon-based detector of a kind of a different variety. And we'll talk a little bit about when you might use one detector over another and um, for what application. So we'll get into that. And I'm, I'm guessing that's why a lot of you folks are on the line today. So we'll, we'll certainly get to that uh, right away. So charge couple devices, uh, been around for a long time. I'm not going to do the quick math, but uh, 50 years or so. I imagine there's a celebration coming up. Um, what's interesting is the Nobel Prize to Boyle and Smith uh, was given in 2009. Um, you know, 40 years after their, their groundbreaking work. Um, what was special about CCDs was, um, and what they've become over the years in development is very efficient photon detectors. So with the advent of, of backside illuminated CCDs, uh, most uh, backside CCD chips have quantum efficiencies, at least in the, in the mid visible range of about 95%. Uh, 100% fill factor on the backside illuminated. There's no electronics between the incoming photons and the pixel collection. Uh, very low read noise uh, for, for general CCD cameras as well as e, uh, specifically EM CCD cameras. And keep in mind, we're talking about here more on the scientific side when we talk about sub-electron read noise. We're talking about deep cooled cameras, um, you know, typically with vacuum assemblies and so forth. And then you'll see some of those other uh, very salient performance features uh, listed as well. So CCDs are kind of the fundamental building blocks of the camera technology we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. So EMCCD is uh, called a CCD with some extra configuration. So it's got a, a active silicon area. Uh, you'll see that in the uh, white colored grid. Then you also have a, we'll call it a storage area. So what's very unique about the EMCCD, and again, this technology was developed uh, some couple of decades ago, um, but uh, EMCCD is, is extremely applicable to a lot of the quantum research being done today, mostly as a result of the uh, uh, low signal. But one of the biggest benefits of it is you can, through the uh, electron multiplication process, you can increase the signal without increasing the, the noise floor. So you get uh, increased dynamic range uh, and, and more information uh, without having the, the, noise, uh, the noise penalty. And if you look at, I'm sure many of the folks on the line today are very familiar with EMCCDs. If you, if you look at research papers in this area, you'll see EMCCDs incorporated uh, quite a bit. One thing about uh, EMCCDs uh, is a, uh, concept we'll call uh, charge, uh, clock-induced charged, and we'll talk about that in a couple seconds. But uh, I'll, I'll end by saying well, EMCCDs are one of the most popular single photon level detectors uh, available. So clock-induced charge. So uh, actually, we're on a QE and sensitivity curve here. So one of the things I wanted to point out was on uh, CCDs, um, there's a lot of different uh, CCDs for different types of imaging applications, depending on uh, how much signal you have, uh, where the signal falls in the spectrum, and so forth. So this, uh, it's a very busy slide, but the intention here is just to show everybody that you can uh, select uh, detectors that are specific for your application. Uh, so there's a lot of different um, applications out there based on uh, whatever ion uh, you're using and so forth. So um, just a reference chart to show that there are different uh, detector types available. And this is the slide I thought I was getting to next, and pardon my confusion. Uh, so there is a clock-induced charge because the inherent performance of the EMCCDs is so low from a, from a read noise, uh, noise generation standpoint. And, and because 
the, the cameras tend to be cooled. Um, most of the traditional noise sources in the cameras are uh, reduced or if not eliminated. However, because of the way the uh, EMCCD is read out, it does, uh, there is a, um, a source of, of noise called clock-induced charge. And so through efficient camera design, um, the spurious noise sources from clock-induced charging uh, are, tend to be nearly eliminated, but it, keep in mind it is a, a noise source that you have to keep in mind when using EMCCD cameras. So intensified CCDs, uh, I'm sure people have seen and maybe not realize what they were, but if you see some of the night vision goggle pictures, uh, the greenish hue, um, when especially with soldiers in the field and since adopted by hunters and other people that do uh, nighttime stuff, uh, it's, it's a way to uh, take very, very low photon flux, very low light levels and artificially increase the signal to the point where you can uh, be visible to the human eye. Uh, originally for night vision applications. So it's a combination of uh, photocathode, photocathodes, microchannel plates, phosphor screens, and so forth, uh, typically ending up with a CCD or CMOS imager on the back end. And through high voltage uh, application, um, the, the low flux is then increased and then converted back to uh, an electrical signal at the camera. Uh, one of the best features of the intensifier, in addition to increasing the amplitude of the signal, is because you have to apply a voltage across it to get it to uh, uh, transfer the charge, the voltage, this can be used as a gate. And as a result, that some cameras can be gated into a range of sub 500 picosecond. Uh, so if you have an application where you're looking at a very... Uh, uh, short duration times of your uh, phenomenon, um, an intensified camera with this electronic shutter gating uh, is an excellent choice. So one of the drawbacks, um, if, you, if you call it a drawback for intensifiers, is they don't have quite the QE of, uh, let's say, a, a back thin CCD. Um, but there are intensifiers out there, especially the Gen 3 intensifiers, have fairly good QE, especially in the visible range. But uh, this is a lot of information on one slide, but the takeaway here is just make sure when you look at intensified cameras, you look at your options as far as what's available uh, based on your, your spectrum range. You know, there are intensifiers that have fairly good QE down in the, in the blue range or UV range and also up in the near IR range. So you do have some options when it comes to using uh, intensified cameras. So many of you on the call might not be aware of uh, technology that marries uh, electron multiplication with intensifiers and in what we coin as a EMI CCD. So it's a uh, fiber optic intensifier combination. So you have intensifier gain and EMC CD gain in the same camera, which gives you uh, extended dynamic range and better linearity. So if you're doing things like, uh, it's often called coincidence imaging or synchronized detection, um, one of the benefits of this camera as well, or this technology is um, it's got a fully calibrated high precision timing generator built in. So if you're doing uh, research where you have to set very precise uh, get, gate pulse widths and delays and so forth, you can very tightly control the not only the image acquisition, but also tie it into your system so that it's synchronized with the uh, system control. And so EMI CCDs have been very well adopted in a lot of different applications uh, in photon counting, certainly, but uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging, spectroscopy, combustion, um, PLIF, and things like that. So uh, it's technology that hasn't been around really long time, but is being adopted fairly rapidly uh, and it has a lot of good applications in uh, quantum research. Just one more slide on EMI CCD. This is uh, my talk about multiple gain states and the higher dynamic range and so forth. This is a, uh, an image where uh, the bottom part is where the, um, the detector was unable to see the signal. Um, it kind of saturated out 
whereas uh, with the um, EMI CCD, uh, much more linear profile with respect to intensity over time. So just an example, if you've got um, uh, very faint signals, um, a very um, efficient way to gather that information. So shifting gears a little bit from um, CCD technology, um, I think most people on this call have looked at CMOS and scientific CMOS as alternatives to CCD technology, and certainly there's there's great applications for CMOS uh, detectors uh, in this research area. So we all know CMOS, if you have an iPhone or an Android phone, uh, just about every consumer product, a backup camera in your car, are all made from uh, CMOS detectors now. Um, because the fabrication process for CMOS is, uh, let's say, more fitting to semiconductor production than uh, CCDs are, um, the benefits of the economy of scale of CMOS detectors lend them to be lower cost. Um, what's interesting is because of some of these improvements and some of the, the great CMOS companies, um, on Semi and Sony to name a couple, have uh, really, really done a great job in improving the CMOS capability. Uh, so scientific CMOS and CMOS, there's really not a fast and hard rule on what's what's what when it comes there. But for the most part, scientific CMOS are defined as uh, low read noise, uh, low dark current, uh, you know, higher performance CMOS cameras. Uh, they can be cooled, single stage uh, TEC cooled or uncooled cameras. Uh, but for the most part, um, scientific CMOS would also be back illuminated devices. And again, QEs of, above uh, 90% and typically fast frame rate. You do tend to have some smaller uh, pixel sizes in CMOS, um, but not necessarily true. There are a couple of companies out there that are making uh, 12 and soon to release uh, 15 micron pixels in CMOS. One drawback that's also being addressed by CMOS suppliers is the fact that most commercial and even scientific CMOS cameras on the market involve a, a rolling shutter um, rather than a global shutter. So, um, you know, global shutter being a, a true snapshot and Global shutter, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, rolling shutter may be ap applicable in a lot of applications. I'm not saying it's 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 a deal breaker, but just keep in mind the the. And if you need more information, we can probably we can definitely uh, give you more information on how rolling shutter works and and uh, how to use it in a scientific application. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, give the origin of CMOS. So uh, most of it goes back to work uh, done at JPL Research. Um, I was contacted re recently by Eric Fossum. He's doing some great work in uh, uh, quantum imaging. Um, so he's still out there and, and, and active in CMOS technology. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, CMOS imagers are uh, going through a, an evolution that's worth keeping keep an eye on. So choosing the right detector, I think by now, um, if I've done a good job, you're somewhat enlightened. If if not, then you might be a little bit confused. So uh, don't be disheartened. There's um, uh, there's a lot of technology out there, and figuring out when to use what is uh, is not a task you can't can't figure out. We do things for folks like put together charts, and we have charts available that kind of gives you a kind of a thumbnail look at when you might use one over the other. But the best thing is to do is to is to contact your suppliers of of equipment and you know discuss your applications and what might work best. But typically, you, things like um, resolution, frame rate, um, you know, how tightly does the image acquisition have to be, and uh, maybe how long do you have to expose, those are some of the requirements or features that might determine when you use one uh, device over another. But certainly, uh, we can help you uh, with that determination. So going beyond the CCD and SCMOS chip and so forth, let's keep in mind there's other things that can be done. Let's call it in the um, input to output chain of, a, of an imaging system. So it's not just the, the CCD. So you have things like uh, vacuum windows and coatings that can um, either enhance imaging in a certain spectrum or perhaps uh, use a narrow band or cut out a uh, signal that might um, interfere with an area that you're concerned with. 
Um, so it's important for quantum imaging because we can do some uh, narrow bandwidth uh, photon emission. So if you have a signal that's very discrete, uh, we can help el eliminate some of the, uh, the unwanted uh, photons and, and be able to, to just collect the kind of photons that you're looking for. And that can be done through different uh, window treatments and coatings in the, uh, in the optical chain. And there's also custom anti-reflective coatings that can be uh, for specific wavelengths or they can be multiband. Uh, most of the coatings have a, a transmi transmission percentage very high. On the left is a, a one that's a kind of specific to a particular application we worked on. But uh, as you can see on the right, it's uh, you know, a multiband uh, filter. Uh, and in the areas where the researcher was very concerned, and you might recognize some of those wavelengths in particular, um, uh, transmissions in the high 90s at those particular wavelengths, and, and then reduction in air areas that were not of concern. Real quick, we'll talk about Exelon technology, which is, I'll be honest with you, proprietary to Princeton Instruments. Uh, it's, a, it's a CCD process. Uh, we develop it for a number of reasons, but it gives a higher QE over a broader wavelength, both in the blue and in the, uh, in the red, and works on both uh, back luminate and deep depleted devices, and it reduces etaloning, especially up in the red range, and also dark current. So we can supply more information on Exelon technology as well. And this is an, uh, an image of uh, before and after an Exelon treatment uh, process on a CCD. You can see the difference. And this is a slide that we showed earlier, but it just intended to show you that you know if you're working in it with a particular um, atom or ion or molecule, uh, keep in mind that not only can you use the general curves, but you can probably find some coatings or so forth that might enhance the uh, signal gathering capability based on your research. So we'll talk about shortwave RR quickly. Um, we talked about the fact that it's 900 nanometers to as high as a 2.2 micron. Um, for the most part, uh, this where we work with is about 7,700 nanometers. But what, what is interesting is there's a lot of fluorescence applications, both in absorption and scattering, where um, uh, the emission is in the shortwave infrared. Um, so it's a good way to quantify molecules in that range. And there's also uh, laser and excitation sources available in that range as well. What's interesting about in-gas is it does have fairly high quantum efficiency. People, a lot of people don't realize this, but uh, shortwave IR, you know, is capable of almost 90% QE. So just a rehash of some of the requirements on the imaging side, and um, keep an eye on the clock here. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to. Um, more on the application side. So this is where we're trying to say, okay, we've talked about some research areas, we've talked about a lot of imaging technology, so how do we, how do we bring them together and, and who's doing what? So I took the liberty of using published research papers and putting together some uh, call them applications where we can talk about specific cameras and why they were important. So this is a, a trapped, ion, uh, trion, trapped ion imaging application with Ytterbium, uh, 369 nanometers. So it talks about you know some of the camera settings as far as the detection time, and uh, in this particular one, it was uh, concerned with determining the state detection, and it was very very high uh, resolution on that. Um, and they used the ICCD camera to uh, measure spin order and shot to, st to shot discrimination. Trapped ion imaging, ton of work being done in this area. What's interesting about trapped ion is um, there is no silver bullet. There's, there's lots of different cameras being used. Uh, CCDs, um, I, I have in here, are replacing um, avalanche photos and I should say are used in conjunction with perhaps. There's a lot of experiments where CCDs are alongside uh, APDs or PMTs. Um, CCD cameras, especially the high resolution ones, now you can get uh, scientific cameras with you know, four megapixel, 16 megapixel and above resolution, if you need that kind of uh, resolution. Gatable devices such as uh, EMICD cameras for synchronized well-defined trigger events, and then EMCCDs um, 
or increased gain for low signal. So all of these technologies are applicable to trapped ion imaging. NV centers, this is an application that used the um, uh, EMI CCD. And the takeaway here was the uh, really tight synchronization between the uh, uh, camera initial initialization and the laser poles. So this, the, in this setup, they were doing, um, you know, the fast gating and on off. Um, so even with the decay on the phosphor of the, the camera, they were able to, uh, in, a, in a temporal fashion, uh, gate the camera quickly enough to image all the phenomena that were, were, were happening. Uh, Bose-Einstein condensate, this is uh, imaging by uh, Dr. Kettley. In this case, they were using a EMCCD camera. Uh, they were running it in a particular mode um, where he was able to, in a burst mode, capture uh, at a rate of million, 1 million frames per second over a very short duration in order to image uh, a very, very tight uh, time, time sequence. Quantum dots and SWEAR. So this, I like this uh, slide and this application because it brings uh, SWEAR into to quantum imaging. This happens to be a, uh, a quantum dot application, uh, lead sulfide, um, and I show some of the parameters used there. Um, so the, the SWEAR camera, the in-gas camera here was cooled down to 83 Kelvin. Um, the excitation was with the 405 nanometer laser, but the uh, uh, imaging was done beyond 1,000 nanometers. I think it was around 1,100 nanometers in this case. And this was an integration time of 10 seconds. So you can imagine um, you have a camera cooled to 83 Kelvin integration time of 10 seconds. So you can imagine how faint the signal was in this case. Um, so this is uh, kind of typical of the work we get involved in as far as uh, trying to image very faint signals and you know, what we do to eliminate all the noise uh, sources and so forth to be able to do that. Uh, this is a slide that just shows a, a sequence for single photon detection. This happens to be a, a non-classical light application, uh, non-classical uh, noise properties, uh, and then subsequently uh, implementing quantum optics. So um, again, just another good example of uh, imaging application. We talked about trapped ion as well. So this was an application where they used a uh, ultra fast uh, gating and a sustained uh, gating repetition rate of uh, one megahertz. I haven't touched too much upon spectroscopy in this talk, but uh, keep in mind that, and I'm sure researchers on, on the line as well are uh, very much involved in spectroscopy. They might have even thought to themselves, how come Mike's not talking too much about spectroscopy? But, um, you know, this happens to be um, a single molecule uh, in, in a precisely controlled nano cavity uh, using a uh, scanning tunneling microscope uh, application. So uh, spectroscopy as well is very fitting for the uh, quantum research areas. Single photon counting. Um, uh, Fraser University in Canada research paper on uh, Photons detected in cubic states, they used an intensified CCD camera for this imaging as well. And I believe they did some binning, which is uh, where you group pixels together to uh, uh, consolidate charge. And this paper just came out, and again, another uh, SWEAR application, uh, carbon nanotubes, uh, and the application being uh, in cryptography and quantum computing. Uh, but a great uh, application for SWEAR because of the uh, emission in the shortwave IR wavelength. This was uh, Stephen Dorn and some of the other folks involved uh, through Los Alamos National Labs. So I realized that was a ton of information in a, what to me at least seemed like a relatively short amount of time. Uh, I encourage everybody to uh, 
if you have any questions, uh, we're, we're going to try to field a few questions here before this uh, webinar is over, but uh, look forward to answering any questions personally or uh, via email or through the website that we can, we can manage for you. Uh, give us a call, contact any of your vendors with questions uh, you know, that I might have, uh, either questions or opportunities that I've raised today that might be of interest to you. And uh, with that, and since we don't have too much time left, I'll uh, uh, ask Robin if you're on the line again, Robin. Yes, I'm, I'm back, Mike. And thank you very much for that uh, very informative presentation. And uh, so we have a few questions here, and I will start with the first question. Question is, there are a lot of camera choices. Which are best for low light, uh, say, for less than 10 photons? OK, that is a good question. And I, I can see why we, we actually get asked that question a lot because, uh, you know, one of the one of the things when you present a lot of options, uh, people tend to say, OK, I understand I have a lot of options, but help, help me understand. Um, so I'll help you understand by uh, kind of giving you a vague answer. So um, photon counting can be accomplished in a variety of ways. I would say that EMCCDs um, and uh, SCMOS uh, in EMICCDs all could uh, attack that application. So um, if you're, if you can use an intensified camera and if gating is needed, uh, you might consider a uh, intensified camera. Uh, otherwise, you could go with EMCCD or uh, SCMOS. Uh, then, you know, if you're, if you're looking at low photon counting as well, you're probably, um, it depends on how much flux there is. If, if you're in a very a uh, low flux situation and you have to go for longer exposures, uh, then you might look at, um, uh, you know, scientific CMOS might not be the right selection if you have uh, long exposure times. Um, so uh, then I would say for single counting, photon counting performance, then you might uh, look at an EMI CCD uh, where we have better linearity and uh, some frame rate advantage there. So uh, it's kind of a matrix uh, question and answer, you know, depending on which boxes you need to check in performance. But, um, you know, under 10 photons, there are some options out there. Um, it just depends on um, your particular requirements. Okay, thank you. The next question here, are cameras wavelength specific, such as one for blue and a different one for red? Mm, okay, let me see if I understand that question. Okay, um, uh, yes and no. It, it depends how blue and how red. If you're if, if if blue is 400 nanometers and red is 750 nanometers, then there's very um, um, generic CCD cameras out there that have great quantum efficiency in uh, that entire range, and you can image across that entire range. Um, uh, and then somewhere in the optical change of, chain, if you wanted to, to stress one wavelength or another, you could do that through some filters and so forth. Um, typically, though, if you're talking deep blue or near IR, uh, for the most part, you're going to use um, a, a different chip or a different uh, coating. Um, you know, so if you want high sensitivity at the kind of the extremes of silicon, you'll most likely uh, choose a different detector. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question here. What is the difference between uh, scientific CMOS and plain old CMOS? Yes, yeah, another good question. So rule of thumb there is uh, scientific CMOS tends to uh, concentrate on low read noise, even though standard uh, CMOS is, is coming out with some pretty interesting specs there. Um, Scientific CMOS cameras typically are uh, cooled to a certain extent, either uh, fan cooled, but for the most part, maybe involve a one stage or two stage uh, thermoelectric cooler. Um, for the most part, uh, scientific CMOS cameras, at least up in, to this stage, are not overly concerned with frame rate as much as um, image acquisition uh, or exposure time and concentrating on higher resolution. A lot of the scientific CMOS cameras are, are moving up in, uh, in resolution. Four megapixels fairly common now, and uh, there's talk of 
uh, you know, 12 and 16 megapixel cameras uh, in the near future for scientific CMOS. Okay, thank you. And next question here. When do you use ICCD over EMCCD? Okay, that's a good question as well. Kind of ties into the first question we had. So um, you can choose an intensified camera if gating, you know, exposure time less than microseconds is needed you know, for, for coincidence imaging or um, time, time sensitive imaging. Uh, for, from a photon source. That's a good good example of where an uh, intensified camera might be worthwhile. Okay. Otherwise, so otherwise EMC or CMOS, uh, you know, would be sufficient as well. Okay. Uh, okay. Sorry, I interrupted you there. Um, this question has to do with aerospace. Uh, in space, we need to have CCD. EMCCD with heat and cold resistance. Does our technology have them today uh, to resist 100 uh, Celsius, 200 C, and minus 100 C, minus 150 C? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, the detectors we get involved with are not built for that extreme. However, uh, uh, there are CCD manufacturers that um, do space grade detectors. So in addition to the uh, temperature uh, requirements, uh, um, I'm assuming along with that is the uh, radiation requirements or the rad radiation hardening requirements. So yeah, there are uh, detector uh, CCD detector companies that specialize in space grade detectors, uh, one of them being E2V. Um, so, yeah, I would certainly contact uh, E2V in the UK uh, and talk to their space group about that application. We don't build cameras for, for in particular, for space applications, just a, a choice on our, on our side, but there are detectors for that. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question here that we have. Why aren't scientific CMOS available with global shutters? Great question. Um, uh, I guess the positive answer would be just just wait a little while. Um, there there are a couple of scientific CMOS cameras out there that are uh, global shutter, um, but for the most part, the reason is because the um, CMOS design was and not only the design, but most of the manufacturing processes are designed around a particular uh, CMOS architecture. And most CMOS imagers are uh, global shutter. Therefore, you know, other than the few uh, CMOS detectors that are specifically designed and manufactured for science, uh, most of them are just inherently of the same uh, uh, rolling shutter um, architecture as commercial devices. But if you look out there, there are some scientific CMOS detectors out there that are global shutter. They tend to be, because they're uh, a, you know, a deviation from the high volume process, they tend to be a little more costly, but, but they are available. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. And I do have a request here uh, for you to share your email address, if that's possible. Yeah, let me go back to, um, Pardon the, uh, I'll go back to the opening screen here. There we go. Yes, uh, note to self, put it on the last slide as well. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, we are just about at the end of the hour, so that's all the time. We have four questions, and um, I would like to thank Everybody, at this time, I'm going to close the webinar. A recording of the webinar will be available shortly after the, after the presentation closes on the Photonics Media website. And I would like to thank our speaker, Michael Melly, our presenter, Princeton Instruments, and all of you uh, attendees for participating in today's webinar hosted by Photonics Media.